Good evening, it's 8 p.m. here local time in Warsaw. I'm your host, Diana Sky, and welcome to World News Tonight on TVP World. Coming up, U.S. President Joe Biden has postponed his trip to Germany due to the impact of Hurricane Milton. Key decisions on Ukraine were to be made at the meeting in Ramstein. And more on that in just a moment, but first, let's take a look at the headlines. During a European Parliament debate in Strasbourg, Polish MEPs criticized Germany for tightening border controls. Elections in Georgia and Moldova are threatened by Russian interference. Inventions enabling machine learning and artificial intelligence development win the Nobel Prize in Physics. Plans for a major summit in Ramstein this weekend have been thrown a curveball with U.S. President Joe Biden forced to postpone his planned trip to Europe. Now it comes as U.S. Vice President and Democratic candidate in next month's U.S. election, Kamala Harris, revealed one of her key bottom lines in negotiations to end the war in Ukraine. Now our chief political correspondent Aaron Demon reports. Just days before Vladimir Zelensky was due to present his long-awaited victory plan to the world, U.S. President Joe Biden calling his attendance off. I'm canceling my trip to Germany and Africa. We're going to try to re work those out later, but uh, I just don't think I can uh, be out of the country at this time. We're driving up preparedness for Hurricane Milton, which uh, could be one of the worst storms in 100 years in Florida. More military aid for Ukraine was also on the agenda for the meeting at the U.S. Ramstein Air Base in Germany. A Ukrainian government official told TVP World that as of this evening, President Zelensky is still planning to attend, but the future of any potential Biden-Zelensky summit is unclear. It's a 60 minutes tradition. Hours earlier, the world got a look inside the mind of Biden's potential successor, Kamala Harris, and how she would negotiate peace in the region. Would you meet with President Vladimir Putin to negotiate a solution to the war in Ukraine? Not bilaterally without Ukraine, no. Ukraine must have a say in the future of Ukraine. A clear bottom line spelled out in an extended interview with CBS's 60 Minutes program. CBS says Donald Trump's campaign cancelled his appearance in the special election sit-down. And Harris did not need a second invitation to go on the offensive. Donald Trump, if he were president, Putin would be sitting in Kyiv right now. He talks about, oh, he can end it on day one. You know what that is? It's about surrender. Her comments come as America pushes for Western allies to ramp up aid and investment, with attention turning to Ukraine's ability to build its own arms. But the issue is cash. We would face the reality. It's not already a challenge to produce, it's a challenge to finance. What Zelensky's victory plan looks like and how the West, including Poland, will respond remains to be seen. Earlier today, Polish President Andrzej Duda announced that he intends to attend the Ramstein summit. Now, the meeting was meant to be attended by leaders and officials from about 50 countries to discuss ways of supporting Ukraine. Now, according to Polish MPs, the possibility of a new military aid package for Kyiv is on the agenda. After President Duda announced his decision to represent Poland at the Ramstein meeting, Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk requested his ministers to prepare the government's position on supporting Ukraine. While President Duda hails from the now opposition party, Law and Justice, when it comes to supporting Ukraine, he tends to go hand in hand with the current administration. I want to ask you, Minister of Defense Kosinia Kamesh and Foreign Minister Sikorski, to prepare an extensive and precise statement for the president on our approach to supporting Ukraine. Ahead of the summit, White House officials said they would ask Poland and other European countries to provide Ukraine with more military aid at the meeting in Germany. Parliamentarians from the Polish ruling coalition are certainly not against the idea. 
The political will is definitely there, and it has been for the past two and a half years. We'll see what exactly gets settled at this upcoming meeting. The fact that the United States and President Biden believe that we should be engaged in the support initiatives even more is a good sign for the future. Since the start of the war, Poland has been one of Ukraine's staunchest supporters. In August, President Duda said that the total value of military aid for Kyiv from Warsaw has so far amounted to close to $3 billion. While it is still uncertain whether Poland will actually announce any additional aid to Ukraine at this coming Ramstein Group meeting, the general feel we are getting here from the corridors of the Polish parliament is that it is definitely a possibility. We will learn more this weekend at the Ramstein Group meeting. My name is Kazimierz Wyszak and you're watching TVP World. A high-ranking Ukrainian official has told the Washington Post that he fears the upcoming winter season. Now, experts say that the Kremlin will try to freeze Ukrainian civilians into accepting territorial concessions to Russia. Ovidiusz Nitsaya reports from the Congress for Rebuilding Ukraine in Poznan. The upcoming winter is making many people in Ukraine worried whether they will be able to have electricity and whether they will be able to heat their homes during the often freezing months of the Ukrainian winter. If the situation doesn't improve, Europe may face yet another massive wave of Ukrainian refugees. Our energy system has already suffered nine massive missile and drone strikes. There is no cure for them and they continue, continue almost daily. These missile strikes caused significant damage and suffering. Our energy system is functioning today, but with significant deviations. For more than two years, Russia has targeted Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Experts say that what the Russians are trying to achieve with this is to make people tired of the war and pressure their government to make uh, concessions to Russia. You know, targeting the civilians is, is a part of uh, Russia's strategy. Uh, because we, we have to consider that uh, the, the, the part of the war is not the army, but the state. And state is also one of the crucial elements of the state is, uh, uh, is the citizens, the, the inhabitants. The energy situation in Ukraine was one of the topics of this event, the Congress for Rebuilding of Ukraine. Here, representatives of politics, business and civil society met together to discuss ways to rebuild Ukraine and help Ukraine during the war. Um, the organizers of this event wanted to create a platform for networking and for people um, to exchange ideas and um, to lay the foundations for the future rebuilding of Ukraine. From Poznań for TVP World, Ovidius Nitea. The UK government has imposed sanctions on the chemical and biological arm of Russia's armed forces. Now, this comes as a response to Russia's alleged use of chemical weapons in Ukraine. Let's now go live to our correspondent in Kyiv, Oz Kataji, who has more on the issue. Good evening, Oz. What kind of chemicals are we talking about here? How have these chemical agents actually have been deployed and, and developed? Uh, good evening. Well, we have had about 4,000 uh, reported suspected cases of chemical uh, weapons being used uh, on Ukrainian soldiers by Russian forces, uh, forces believed to be under the command of the radiological, uh, chemical and biological uh, defense forces of Russia. Now, uh, the Ukrainian, uh, sorry, the U British Foreign Secretary uh, David Lamy announced these sanctions today targeting this group and uh, their, their uh, commander, Lieutenant General Igor Kirillov. Uh, now, as, as you were saying, the, these weapons that, that, that are being used are being described as chemical irritants uh, that make it difficult to breathe, that cause burning in the eyes, ears and throat uh, regions. So not, we're not talking about nerve agents here at the moment, but we are still talking about uh, weapons that are banned under the chemical weapons conventions. Uh, so, the, you know, the British Foreign Office is taking this uh, very, very seriously. Uh, the question now is uh, whether the Allies respond to this. Uh, the, there have been reports of these for some time. Uh, this is a major development, being Britain uh, being the first, really, to come out uh, and, and issue sanctions about this. So... Uh, one now for Europe and the United States to see if they follow suit. It's really a, a briefly, do we know anything about the a kind of sanctions uh, that have been imposed? 
These will be obviously, you know, the same kinds of financial and travel sanctions uh, imposed across uh, various uh, swathes of, of uh, senior figures in the Russian uh, government. Uh, nothing beyond that, as far as we know. Uh, but these could be, you know, significant final financial sanctions uh, for this specific uh, division of the Russian army. Thank you so much, uh, Oz Katerji, uh, reporting to us live from Kiev on how reports of 4,000 uh, chemical weapons being used by Russia on Ukrainian soldiers. Thank you so much, uh, Oz, and stay safe. Many view the Schengen zone as one of the European Union's greatest achievements. And Germany's unilateral decision to reinstate strict border checks has raised concerns among Polish MEPs during the European Parliament's plenary session in Strasbourg. As Berlin tightened its borders, neighboring countries have voiced their concern over the decision, which endangers a cornerstone of the European project, free movement. Yesterday we had a debate on what is effectively the suspension of free travel in the Schengen zone, a debate initiated by Mr. Sankiewicz. It was a very important debate, one that I'm sure will be continued at the upcoming European Council session. However, the European Commission has not chastised Germany on the issue, despite the Commissioner for Home Affairs speaking out against the policy set out by Berlin. Too many of our citizens and businesses have negative experiences with border checks. Internal border controls must be temporary, a measure of last resort. Despite the potential domino effect of other nations also imposing border checks, European governments are under pressure from domestic political shifts from France to Austria and across Central Europe. Nationalist parties have secured electoral victories and the focus has moved to migration as a core theme. The decision by Germany has also called into question the EU's migration and asylum pact, which is still in its transition phase and was years in the making. It has to be um, uh, probably once again thought over and probably adjusted to today's situation. It's a unique situation. We haven't been since the Second World War. Uh, Europe has, uh, has, never, uh, has never been in, in, in such circumstances and therefore we have to probably to adjust it to the new realities. Ever since the migration crisis of 2015, which saw millions of refugees from the Middle East and North Africa enter Europe, migration has been a continuous challenge for the continent. And now, with the deteriorating situation in Gaza and Lebanon, a new wave of refugees could be headed to the EU. With unilateral decisions, however, and a lack of common policy, Europe risks yet another crisis. The European Union is concerned about Russian influence on the upcoming presidential elections in Moldova and threats to political pluralism in Georgia. Now, reports indicate that Moscow is using bribes and other illegal activities to change the vote result. Now, on October 20, Moldova will hold its presidential election and a referendum on EU accession. Six days later, Georgia will hold parliamentary elections. Reportedly, pro-Russian groups have already bribed more than 130,000 Moldovans to vote against a referendum, funneling a staggering 15 million U.S. dollars. Given the um, country's relatively small size, this number is definitely not insignificant. In Georgia, the president may face impeachment after vetoing a Russian-modeled anti-LGBT law. But the ruling party, Georgian Dream, lacks sufficient votes in the parliament to impeach the pro-Western Salome Zurabishvili. But how exactly does Russia plan to influence the elections in these two countries? The narrative um, says that Western actors are trying to drag Georgia and Moldova into the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine and open a second front. Georgia and Moldova are handling the mounting pressure differently. Moldovan government has been taking quite effective countermeasures uh, against Russia's um, hybrid threat. And in Georgia, uh, the government simply denies the existence of this threat. But the European Union does not stand alone against Putin's hybrid war. The GRU in particular is on a sustained mission to generate mayhem on British and European streets. We've seen arson, sabotage and more. This isn't the first time Moscow has tried to influence decisive elections. The U.S. is still dealing with the fallout of the Russian narrative spun during the 2016 presidential election. 
and smaller countries like Georgia or Moldova may need all the help they can get to battle Russian propaganda. And returning now to the U.S., President Joe Biden has decided to postpone his visit to Germany over Hurricane Milton. Now, this could be one of the most devastating natural disasters in U.S. history. And more, for more on that, let's move live to Washington, where our correspondent Alex Sumlinski is waiting with more insight into the situation. Hello, Alex. What can you tell us about uh, this uh, hurricane? When is it supposed to hit? Um, how can you say from what you're seeing that the United States is uh, preparing for this? Good evening, Diana. Well, this move by President Joe Biden to postpone his visit to Germany. He was supposed to fly out to Berlin on Thursday. And then after that, he was supposed to fly to Angola. And he was set to return to the United States on October 15th. Now, this would have been his first trip to the African continent as president. Now, this move comes during a very intense time of campaigning here in the United States, as, of course, the presidential elections are coming up on November 5th. Now, former president and Republican candidate Donald Trump has criticized both President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic nominee, uh, who is, of course, set to uh, take part in the upcoming elections, that they didn't do enough and that they weren't on the scene right after the previous hurricane, that is Hurricane Helen, after that hurricane hit, even though both Biden and Harris visited North Carolina and Georgia after that hurricane happened. Now, Donald Trump even went so far as to say that the current administration has uh, limited funds when it comes to disaster relief because he claims that these funds, which were intended for that have been used on illegal migrants, even though there is no evidence that uh, funds from FEMA were used for, for, for um, situations other than natural disasters. Now, Hurricane Milton is expected to make landfall on Florida's west coast on Wednesday. And as of now, more than 50 counties in Florida are in, um, in the state of emergency. Back to you, Diana. That's Alex Sumlinski reporting to us live from Washington. Alex will be coming back to you throughout the, throughout the rest of the, uh, the evening. John Hopfield and Jeffrey Hinton have been awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for discoveries and inventions that enable machine learning with artificial neural networks. Now, their groundbreaking discoveries have opened the door for further AI development that will mark another revolution for humankind. Jeffrey Hinton had a doctor's appointment scheduled for Tuesday, but he had to change his plans when he received a surprise phone call from Sweden. Good morning, Professor Hinton. Good morning. Please accept our warmest congratulations to receiving the Nobel Prize in Physics. Thank you very much. Uh, how do you feel right now? I'm flabbergasted. Hinton received a joint award with John Hopfield for foundational discoveries and inventions that enable machine learning with artificial neural networks. The Nobel Committee for Physics gives the award for discoveries that have been of great benefit to mankind. Recently, as artificial neural networks are becoming more and more powerful, we see the, the benefit of these. The, the potential benefit is, is very large. The Nobel Prize in Physics is awarded for discoveries or inventions, but this year's laureates were distinguished for both. It started with a discovery and uh, then uh, evol uh, evolved into uh, something that we can actually use. It's machine learning, it's uh, artificial intelligence. Hinton and Hopfield's groundbreaking research dates back to the 1980s. Back then, 40 years ago, there were no big computer centers that could actually scale up so much the, the learning process. Today, these breakthrough discoveries have laid the groundwork for way more than just humorous AI-generated songs. Experts say it loud and clear, these AI developments are a turning point for humanity. It's just another revolution in the humankind. We had many revolutions like this in the history, starting from, uh, I don't know, uh, copper. One such revolution happened in the beginning of the 20th century. In 1903, Maria Skłodowska-Curie, a Polish scientist, received a Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of radioactivity. But a TVP reporter in Stockholm found a Polish element in today's prize as well. One of the laureates, John Hopfield, has 
Polish origins. His father, John Hopfield Sr., also a physicist, was born in Płock, Poland, and emigrated to the United States as a young man. Skłodowska was not only the first woman to receive a Nobel Prize, she is also the only woman ever to receive two Nobel Prizes, the second one in chemistry. Whether or not there will be some reference to Poland in this category will become known on Wednesday, when Nobel Prizes in chemistry are to be revealed. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is preparing to present a comprehensive victory plan to Ukraine's allies at an upcoming summit in Rammstein in Germany this weekend. Now, with winter approaching, the potential reduction in U.S. support and the ongoing debate with the NATO about Ukraine's use of advanced arms, the stakes are high for Kyiv and its partners. And joining me now to discuss this and more is Yevhenia Kravchuk, Deputy Chair of the Ukrainian Committee on Humanitarian and Information Policy. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Yevhenia. Thank you so much for being with us here uh, on World News Tonight on uh, TVP World. Thank you for having me. So, I mean, a lot has been uh, a lot has been uh, going on. That we have uh, quite a few topics to tackle, but let's let's take it first from uh, the latest uh, the, the the latest words uh, coming out from of Kamala Harris in her uh, recent interview. Now, uh, Kamala Harris said that if she would become the next president of the United States, that she would not meet with Russia's president uh, Vladimir Putin to negotiate an end to the war in Ukraine, unless, of course, Kiev was involved. Now, on the other hand, Donald Trump said that he would be able to end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours. What is your reaction to this? Well, uh, first of all, um, um, I would, you know, uh, not comment the electoral process and how these statements are, um, um, you know, used in uh, the process of presidential elections. What I can say that uh, so far the official position of uh, Department of State um, uh, is the same, that Ukraine has to be uh, involved in any negotiations if they happen or when they happen. Um, and it's uh, actually the position of uh, all the allies, uh, those, by the way, who will be meeting in Rammstein uh, just this week in Germany. Um, so, it, you know, it, it cannot be decided without the country who was attacked. Um, regarding Donald Trump, um, you know, President Zelensky already said that he uh, doesn't really understand how it could be ended in um, 24 hours. Uh, so, you know, it has to be explained uh, further. Uh, but in any case, it's very good that um, Zelensky, when he went to uh, United States, uh, he um, met both President Biden, uh, um, Kamala Harris, and uh, Donald Trump. And they had a conversation um, after which they gave a, a press conference together. Um, and, you know, overall, the communication went well. Even tell me, so the, the latest news that we have coming out of Washington uh, earlier today is that uh, U.S. President Joe Biden has not canceled. However, he has postponed his trip to uh, Rammstein. Now, what do we know on whether uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, will, in fact, uh, attend uh, this summit? Is it still going to go forward? What, what can you tell us about this? Well, the summit, of course, will happen. I cannot uh, disclose the um, uh, plans of President Zelensky. Um, and, um, um, of course, um, uh, these meetings, they do come regularly. Uh, and it's quite understandable, uh, this announcement of uh, postponing um, of Biden's visit because, uh, indeed, the situation with the hurricane in Florida is, um, you know, very serious and it has to be um, explored more in, in coming days uh, how it goes. And it's if you would turn on uh, any of the news on American TV channels, they all speak about uh, this issue, about hurricane, about uh, domestic mm -hmm. uh, things. Um, but of course, uh, we want uh, this um, meeting in Rammstein to be resultive, uh, especially uh, before the, you know, very difficult winter, uh, though we are very thankful that the uh, United States issued the package of aid not long ago on the 26th of September, and it contains, um, you know, it, it's worth $7.9 billion. So there is some, um, you know, planning um, you know, for, for the aid um, uh, for Ukraine. 
can you just go a little bit into uh, more details about uh, uh, what what would you say that Ukraine expects from the the outcome of this uh, of this uh, summit to be held in uh, Ramstein on the weekend? Well, of course, uh, on the one hand, uh, we need to have, um, you know, planning on uh, receiving uh, weapons, receiving artillery shells. Uh, for example, this initiative that um, a president of Czech Republic uh, started uh, now is fulfilled on one third. Uh, so, uh, of course, it, it has to be uh, finished. Um, another thing that uh, will be discussed, um, I believe, uh, that uh, actually the investments could come to the military production of Ukraine uh, because right now um, we developed our own productions of drones of uh, even jamming machines uh, but also marine drones um, we even started to produce our own 155 artillery um, that suits all of the artillery systems uh, that we got from Western partners but um, we do not have uh, enough of our own money um, to buy out all these weapons so basically uh, if uh, countries, for example, Denmark already did that, uh, would uh, buy the weapons directly uh, f from the producers in Ukraine, it would be much cheaper um, and actually will be faster deployed to the battlefield. And of course, uh, the uh, NATO or some other security guarantees um, should be uh, discussed. And of course, for us, uh, membership in NATO is the ultimate goal. Uh, but, um, you know, we need to understand what are uh, the security guarantees of Ukraine, so we would not run um, into another, you know, bloody war uh, in 10 or 20 years because Russia is not going anywhere. Ivania, do you think that Ukraine may be offered more concrete steps regarding uh, NATO membership? Well, uh, I totally think that uh, NATO will need at one point Ukraine because we will have the most trained army, uh, at least um, in, in the European continent, um, and we will be this eastern frontier. Um, uh, of course, uh, it has to be a consensus of all the members of NATO, and of course, the position of United States is somewhat crucial because they are the biggest contributors, um, biggest donors to the NATO um, uh, um, a budget. But we had a very promising and symbolical visit of Mark Rutte. He was just um, in Kiev a few days ago. It was his first visit in the capacity of new Secretary General of NATO. And uh, he, he was quite firm that uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, sooner or later, better sooner, Ukraine you know, will be uh, or has to be uh, a member of the alliance. Let me shift you a little bit uh, to uh, the latest sanctions on Russia that mainly the UK has uh, has said it has imposed. Do you think that these sanctions, uh, that these measures have a significant impact on Russia to be able to continue uh, its war, to continue targeting uh, Ukrainian civilians and infrastructure inside Ukraine? Uh, well, I did not follow closely the um, the concrete sanctions that Great Britain imposed, but overall, I would say that uh, sanctions do work. Of course, there are loopholes, but if sanctions didn't work, the uh, Hasprom would not be in debt uh, for the second year in the row, and you know it's just dropping and dropping the revenue that they get. And also, Russia would not be trying so hard to uh, lift the uh, sanctions, even the, the sanctions on diamonds. Uh, had um, influenced um, um, quite a lot. What we also see that still uh, there are loopholes in transferring um, electronics, microchips from different countries, United States, Great Britain, Switzerland, Germany, uh, to uh, Russia through uh, third companies, third countries, uh, because we find uh, Western microchips um, and, and parts, um, uh, especially electronics, uh, in drones and both missiles. For example, the missile that hit Ohmadid, the children's hospital, in July, contained uh, the, the parts that were made uh, in Western countries, and this missile was produced in April this year, so pretty fresh. Thank you so much, uh, Yevgenia Kravchuk, for all your input you. uh, today on, uh, such a, on such an important uh, topic and um, definitely developing on what will come uh, out of that uh, meeting in Ramstein over the weekend. Thank you so much, uh, Yevgenia Kravchuk, Deputy Chair of the Ukrainian Thank Committee on pleasure. Humanitarian and Information Policy. And that's all for this edition of World News Tonight here on TVP World. I'm Diana Skaya. 
Stay tuned for more news here on TVP World. Good night.